Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we have Marco and Hillary Romero, and they flew in from San Antonio, Texas to share how they've acquired over 30 properties, and they're buying everything with private money. Yep. If this is your first time tuning in, I am Steve Trang, broker and owner of Stunning Homes Realty, founder of the Offer Fast Homes app, the only MLS for off-market wholesale properties, and you'll be in Texas come October. Uh, and I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires, so that's something you want to do. Let's connect on Instagram. If you're excited for today's show, please give me a wave, give me a thumbs up, and as a friendly reminder, I do not charge dime for the show. I don't make any money doing this, so here's all I ask. This is what it costs for you to listen to the show. We're trying to reach more people on YouTube. And in order to do that, I need you to subscribe right now and click on the bell as you watch and listen to this episode because that's the only way YouTube will show these videos to more people. In addition, if you have a friend that needs to listen to this episode, please tag them right now. That way we can all grow together. And don't forget, this is a live show, so please post your questions for Marco and Hillary to answer. Ready? We totally I'm excited. Ready? Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm glad that you guys can come out, and make it a trip uh, for the whole family and everything. It's been we fun. did. We made it. Today's fun. been a nice break away from <laughs> yeah, the kids. Yeah, a break from the family. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, what got you guys into real estate? Well, that's easy. Marco got me into real estate. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so, I um, what really started off for me uh, was I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in high school, and there was that completely changed my mindset in a lot of ways. I was on the normal trajectory of get good grades, go to school, and uh, get a good job. And there was a lot of great concepts in there, like passive income, those type of things. Everybody talks about Rich uh, rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. But one of the main takeaways that I took from that book was uh, getting jobs to build certain skill sets. And prior to that, I never had a job. So I took a bunch of jobs. I used to sell knives. I worked at different restaurants to build my sales skills because I always wanted to be a real estate investor and a businessman. I eventually ended up joining a a real estate education mentor group. Uh, Before that, though, I did pay a mentor 10 grand that ended up moving like a month later. So that that was a big uh, (laughs) loss right in the beginning. I was like 22 or 23. Very quick lesson learned. Yes, Yes. very, very quick. Um, But then I ended up joining an education mentor group and I was young, I was like 22, 23, and I was there all the time at their office. Annoyingly so. Yes, very annoying. I was that annoying young guy that yeah. was just like what wanting to get as much mm-hmm. as I could. I wanted to be around them. I wanted. I was in the office all the time. I don't think that's annoying. It, I, I imagine I was pretty annoying. As long as you're eager and doing stuff. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's true. true. <laughs> well, see, that was uh, that put me in a position for opportunity because they recognized that I was there all the time. Right. And they asked me to become one of their in-house agents to uh, represent their members uh, because I was a member first, mm-hmm. uh, but to represent their members to find uh, investment quality properties for them and to represent them. And yep. I found that to be an amazing opportunity because I was able to leverage my um, m- uh, their experiences and learn on how they dealt with problems, how they found properties, when fires came up, what they did, how they got the financing in place, how they evaluated it, and it was like a crash course in learning. So this was a, a, a firm to buy rental properties for cash flowing for clients? Like it was yeah, so it was, a, it was uh, an education and mentor group and they uh, brought in members that they taught how to cash flow rental real estate mm-hmm. and they had two programs, one for single family and then another one for multifamily. So I became an agent focusing on the single family clients and I was actually at that membership level originally. Mm-hmm and uh, did that for a while, but as an agent, your income is really capped um, based on the price point of homes that you're acquiring. Right. And I found out about wholesaling. I uh, started wholesaling uh, probably after three years or so, I was an agent and then I started wholesaling and uh, did that pretty successfully on my own. My income skyrocketed. I was doing much better. I was learning really quick. And then eventually I uh, well, was- Well, then we met. Right, that's where we met. And I was like, what do you do? And I thought, like, wholesaling, I was like, this has to be illegal. Like, I don't understand <laughs> what's going on. But he explained it to me, and I was like, you never would have thought that you could make money doing something like that. And I remember I had to go to work, and I'd be like, okay, well, bye. Um, enjoy laying in bed while you're on your phone making <laughs> deals happen. I didn't understand it, but I was just, like, jealous that he got to do that and had and the I, freedom to do that. I think she was watching Breaking Bad a lot during this time, too, <laughs> right. so she, you know, didn't understand. So what, what year was this that you got into this uh mentorship membership so that program. was about 10 years ago and that's how it kind of got started and then okay. i started wholesaling about seven years ago mm-hmm. and on then your own on my own 
and then I and then I did that for like two to three years. The timeline's kind of fuzzy there. And then at the end of me doing it independently is when we met. Mm-hmm. And then I had, at that time I was wholesaling a lot to a, a bunch of people, but particularly one company. And they asked me to join their company and run their acquisition team. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up joining them, and that's when our relationship started to grow. Her her talents got deeper and deeper in. Mm-hmm. What company was that? Uh, ATW Investments. Okay. So not a hedge fund or nothing like that? No, but at the time they were um, doing a lot of volume. Uh, they are probably one of the top, uh, in Central Texas, one of the top companies creating notes. They would sell properties owner finance. Mm-hmm. And they were actually bringing in money from uh, overseas uh, to do their deals. Australia investors. Gotcha. Primarily. Right. right. But okay. all over the place. They had contacts everywhere. So you had this experience working for this first firm. Mm-hmm. on how to wholesale or what, or what the wholesaling business and you went off on your own seamless transition any challenges no so when um i already had the concept of i knew the concept of wholesaling uh, but i had a lot of mental blocks of like oh i can't do it on my own i don't know how to do it those type of things but eventually i just kind of you know went on my own and i said you know i'm going to try and figure it out and i you know, went out there and just, I just tried to connect with people. My first deal that I did, I kind of like partnered with somebody and we kind of made it happen. Um, but then we ended up joining this company and I ran their acquisition team that we had a, eventually we had a total of nine guys that I was kind of overseeing. We did over a hundred deals in one year. So we were wow. doing a lot of volume and I really learned from how they had things. But the big change is actually at this point, Hillary and I decided to get married. Mm-hmm. I proposed to her. Was it a good proposal? It was, gr- it was yeah, okay. it was a good one. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it. It was on my thirtieth birthday, so I was not prepared for that. Uh, and then we had a quick engagement, like a three month engagement, and so we got married pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. We just both knew there was no point in like delaying it. We just wanted to get married and be together and start a family. Well, not that quickly, but this right. is where it gets interesting because um, we, you know, we got married and uh, we we planned our honeymoon a little like ways a month out, later. ways out. And uh, leading up to the, our honeymoon, we had already decided that, you know what, Hillary, you know, why don't you quit your job? Because she wasn't happy where she was. Why don't you quit your job? You know, I already have this position where I'm at uh, with this company. And, you know, we'll use that as our income. And, you know, you can figure out, we'll figure out what you want to do, find something that's more right. fulfilling. And then what happened? Well, we got, or I got pregnant very quickly, like immediately, like wedding night. <laughs> Very and so quickly. that was so we took our honeymoon about a month later and so mm-hmm. right before the honeymoon I found out I was pregnant and so I was like wow this is kind of scary because I had already quit my job and um, on the honeymoon we went to the Bahamas on, on our honeymoon uh, he was reading four hour work week by Tim Ferriss and he Fantastic just book. He, yeah he looked at me we were up by the pool the fun side of the pool and uh, he looked at me because we're fun people right yeah it was like the fun deep music was going and um, I was Still not newly drinking. Married, not really newly married. married. <laughs> yeah, but I was not drinking. Um, and he was reading this book and he just put it down. And I remember him looking at me and just being like, I think I'm going to quit my job and we're going to do this full time. And it was scary, but like super exciting at the same time. And so many changes. Like I quit. So I was used to having a salaried paid job. So I was, I was used to the consistent uh, security of every two weeks getting paid. And he was bringing in money. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to go, to go down to this one, you know, salary and and she came from the mindset of, you know, 401k, a secure, yeah, yeah, exactly, secure job, save up, you know, work your way up. Being an entrepreneur or investing, that was like very foreign. That was hard and for scary. me. So it was very scary, but I was excited too, because we, at the time, we really didn't get to see very much of each other. We were both working so many hours and we'd come home at seven o'clock at night, cook dinner, do a quick workout, yeah. go to bed. And like sometimes the weekends would happen because he was all often working. Oh, you were working on weekends too? I was there working were some, all the time. Yeah, I, I was mean, committed. He was to above and beyond committed to this job, yeah. and yeah. it didn't feel like a whole lot of payoff. Um, just his time was very limited, and so it was exciting at the same time because even though I was scared to take this leap into the unknown, I put 100% faith into him because um, I into knew us. and into us. But I knew that we could do it together with his knowledge and background and education um, and just experience with being an, an agent and wholesaling. Um, but I was also really excited. I was looking forward to getting to spend all, so much more time with him. And yeah. we now we're together like 98% of the time, like all the time. So all the time. When all the time. you quit your job, <laughs> how much were you making? Um, 
not very well compared to what he was bringing in doing it independently i was probably making like fifty two thousand a year okay it was and like, you're, what were you making when i you was went? over six figures uh just about six figures yeah. at that job so i knew i could support us and we'd be you know comfortable obviously it's a little bit of a scale back but um i knew that i could support us but then you know i threw everything for a little and that was all at the same time we had just got mm-hmm. married just had our money honeymoon we both quit our jobs simultaneously basically Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we had a baby on the way so there was like a a countdown to like try and get things done well i think that's really important right because a lot of guys or a lot of people are listening to the show and it's like you know when's the right time to quit you got security you got every two weeks you get your paycheck coming in and i have friends that that you know listen to the show and they're making well north of six figures like when's the right time and really it's just no right time. You just gotta put your stake in the ground and just do it. You gotta just do it before you look back. 10 years have gone past and you're like, I n- always wanted to do this. And time goes by so quickly now. I feel like this last year has gone by insanely quick. And so you just have to do it or you're just never going to. And it, you know, it wasn't, um, we weren't like in a dire situation either. I, you know, when we both decided to quit our jobs and do this, I had uh, extreme confidence because I had already supported myself mm-hmm. independently as a wholesaler. So I knew what kind of money I could bring in and I was making six figures then too. So yeah. I knew that I could right. uh, really do it. And, um, you know, we were be doing it together and that was kind of always the vision that I wanted for our family and we wanted together is to be able to um, do this um, all together. And we also had a decent sized nest egg. We had like 40 grand And we or were so. living way below our means. Yeah. Like yeah. way below. I had her move into my <laughs> like little townhouse. Like a really sketchy townhouse. <laughs> but it was like, it was like 650 a month. It was. And, and, and water we were was paid. Saving, yeah, we were saving a lot of money. I had a, It took me a lot to convince her, but. We but got that's her part there. of entrepreneurship, right? In yeah, the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. You have but to was, live below your fun. means. I actually kind of liked that place she looking back. She talks about it. Fond memories. I mean, at the just, time, it wasn't We fun started for her. our life together, and it was like, you know, the beginning. Like, yeah. we came from this place where, you know, you walk out your front door, and there's cop cars, and you're like, wow, we're like really in the sketchy, a sketchy part they of town. They weren't in the front door. They were down a down little bit over. Yeah, down the road. They weren't right in front. So we got, I think, yeah, Quentin. Mm-hmm. You got, was it Michael? Giannis. Giannis. Yeah. Hey. They're all great people. You got Aaron out there. Hey, you Aaron. Got, you hey, got Mike. JR Charles. Hernandez out there. JR. Like, mm-hmm. How is your business different than your local competitors, local what, peers? What would you say? How we're different? We're husband wife duo. I don't know. I mean, they're all awesome people. All those are great people. Um, the fact that we do it together is huge. Uh, we're very family focused because we're growing our family. And mm-hmm. the whole reason we're doing this is to be able to create a life that we, our family is always around and we're always growing and doing things together. Um, we try and do, we really try and uh, particularly do things the right way and bend over backwards to make sure we hold to our word and our reputation. We hold that really high. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say that makes us different, but that's something that we hold in very high esteem and we try and, um, ingrain that in our team and um the the, one of the things that we are different about is the private money Mm -hmm. there there aren't too many people that do it fully like we do there's you know there's some people that don't do it at all or some people that do it you know sparingly here and there but that was a commitment that we really tried to push towards is Mm -hmm. developing the relationships and, and growing private money but we're also doing that in combination with wholesaling so and kids yeah, the kids. It's so hard. So uh, let's take a step back. You said, you know, you guys are really family focused. So does that mean like in your office, everyone else is family focused? Or are you saying just the way you guys run your business is family focused? I guess the way that we run it, but we bring our kids to the office and yeah. they're with us. I mean, for the longest time. If we, we have, have to, yeah. And we're kind of getting at the point where we don't bring them anymore, uh, mainly our son. Just because he's at that age where he's... Banging wants, and everything. Yeah. yeah. And we had like this whole. He has this whole corner of all this amazing kid stuff, but, but he, he wants to play it. with my computer cables. And the cords and, and everything else. You know, all the fun stuff that, that is he more can't exciting. get to play yeah. with. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a little bit challenging because when, when we do bring him, it's I need to do a couple of really important things. So he'll take the baby and then he's not very productive. And we kind of keep passing him back and forth. So then neither of us are very productive all yeah. day. Yeah. So but our team really hard. helps us too. Oh, yeah. They'll step in they and love hold our, they our love the baby. baby and walk him around and take care of him and try and help him walk yeah. and crawl. Yeah. The so team's great. Our team really helps us with our children. They're, yeah. they're very, um, 
They love our kids. Yeah. Okay. So then going back to the private money, elaborate on that. What does that mean that you guys are using private money? So we pretty much 100% purchase all of our portfolio with 100% private funds. So that's purchase price, uh, closing cost, rehab. We really don't come out of pocket at all. Unless there's some, for some crazy reason, you know, the rehab, the foundation screwed up all of these different things and, you know, our miscellaneous budget to take care of those items that come up. You know, you always wanna have like a little safety money on a, on a rehab project. Um, it, maybe worst case scenario, we've come out like two grand, like, we had one scenario where the foundation we fixed and like we came to look at the house and like the entire roof was waved because yeah it buckled in several spots i was like well so that needs and to it get was fixed. a good roof like, it, was it was perfect was roof. roof and so then. like because the shifting of the foundation like we had to put a total new roof on oh and, wow yeah. and i think also the, and plumbing, the foundation wasn't even that bad it was it kind of a surprise yeah it wasn't yeah. bad at Extra all but you grand. always want to have like that you know money just in case that something like that comes up so I mean, I think in, in the past we've come out a couple thousand maybe, but it's really been very minimal, probably 5,000 or under per deal. And that's so, not every deal. So when you guys talking private money though, I mean, there's wholesaling, there's wholesaling, there's mm -hmm. flipping, and there's buy and hold. Mm -hmm. Where are you guys primarily using the private money to your advantage? So we have two main focuses. We have the wholesaling side and our company for that is Hilco Homes. And that's where we have our team. Mm -hmm. And there's 11 of us total. And then um, we have our other company, which is called Bella Buyers. And that's just Hillary and I. Now, we do hire contractors and those type of things, but those are all third party. They're not part of our company. We don't do any hoteling. We don't do any flipping. All we're doing is buy and hold them as rentals. When we first started out, um, it's been an evolving process, but when we first started out, we were focusing on owner finance exits, mm -hmm. so we were creating notes. Um, but we've changed our model, and now we're primarily focusing on rentals, and the private money is strictly for, um, strictly for those rentals. Though we do uh, have worked with some, uh, we call them campaign investors. Um, other individuals, sometimes there are private lenders, well, they'll give us some funds on their wholesaling side and they'll give us funds to market mm -hmm. for deals and then mm -hmm. we'll split uh, the proceeds of that deal with them. So, Gotcha. Campaign. We campaign. call them campaign investors. Interesting. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. Uh, so are you guys leveraging, because like this, what, what I do is our private money basically helps us support our wholesaling operation because when we tell a seller we're going to buy their house, either we're gonna buy the house or we're gonna wholesale it, but if we can't wholesale it, for sure we're performing. Mm -hmm. right. So for us, private money is huge in that we have a financial backstop to close on a deal, then it's a wholesale or a flip. So are you guys using it for that or you guys aren't using that for that at all? Not no, currently. And we haven't really had situations like that come up where we had to do like a, you know, a jump in and save the deal or anything like that, really, yeah. from a private lender standpoint. Mm -mm. Okay, so then it's primarily just to fund your buy and hold. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So then in funding this or in raising capital, what are you guys, what strategies are you guys using for raising private capital? So uh -huh. n going back to, we both quit our jobs mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that, w th that time was like what, October, 2015. Yep. Okay. And you officially quit like Thanksgiving time. Yeah. So we said, all right, we're getting towards the end of the year. We're just going to take the holidays to just kind of chill and relax. And then January 1st, we're really going to go at it. Right. So, um, and also at this, up until this point, I've been in real estate at that point, probably about seven years at that point. And I had helped a lot of people acquire their own properties, not only as representing them as agents, but also wholesaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of mental blocks, a lot of mental barriers and like excuses I was telling myself to why I hadn't kept my own properties. Now I kind of had done some partnerships like with my family for like maybe a flip here or there or a rental or whatever, but I never really acquired one on my own. And since we were doing this together, that was fundamentally something that was important to both of us. So. The first thing I did was just make a big ass list <laughs> and call one by one by one by one by one. And I tell everybody that. And, um, and he still calls down the list. Yep. And, um, and it, it's, it's really important for everybody to do that. And I tell a lot of people do that to do that. And not a lot of people do it because there's a lot of fear associated with that. As you're making this list, you're immediately, your brain just automatically goes, oh, that person doesn't have money or that's going to be an awkward conversation or 
uh, I don't want to bring that up with them because they're my grandparents and that would be an awkward dynamic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just say, hey, you know, put down all your family members, put down all your friends, put down all your family friends down, put down all your old coworkers, your old bosses, people you went to school with. And it turns out our first private money lender uh, was one of my old college buddies from back in the day. And he's known that I was in real estate for all these years, years, years. And eventually I just called him up and said, hey, I'm serious. We are gonna, uh, uh, we're mm-hmm. gonna purchase properties and uh, you know, come in this next year, at that time it was 2016, if we found one deal, would you be interested in working with us on that deal? And we got a lot of no's, some maybes, and then DJ was his name. He said yes. And so then we did our, he, he brought all the money, we did all the work, and we were able to do our first mm-hmm. deal. And the story has been basically that same story across the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of our private money lenders are just real people. Um, who are typically older, they have money just chilling in a bank account or in a f- retirement account, 401k, IRA, or something like that. And or they were investors that are tired of being landlords. That's a big they one just right wanna, there. Yeah. They're older, they're just like, we'd rather make our return on, you know. The, Some of our best private lenders were people that yep. I represented as an agent like three years ago or four years ago. And they're just tired. They used to do it themselves, <laughs> but now that they're older, they just want to travel. They don't want to have to go through the grind of finding the house and, and then rehabbing and all and that stuff. So we try and handle all mm-hmm. that for them. Gotcha. So are they, are you paying them a set percentage? Is there an equitable position? Like how does that all, how's all that structured? So our very first deal, uh, actually our first two deals we did as a partnership. They were kind of a money person and we were the do all the work couple. And then we were orchestrating to where it was a 50-50 split of profits uh, once we tallied everything up. Excuse me. But what we wanted to do to be able to grow faster is have more control of the equity and more control over the deal. Even though we were like the decision makers on everything, Mm -hmm. there's that uh, responsibility that's there that you feel you kind of need to run everything through your partner. Mm -hmm. Even if they're like, yes, 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 yes. You know, there's that whole element of, you know, running through uh, things through them. So having more control um, that just slows us down when you like yeah. you know you have to like make sure make everything's quick decisions approved. Sometimes, oh, yeah. so, so I've had you know situations where I had private money mm-hmm. partners on flips, and it's like I'll call them, it's like this is what we're doing. Like, okay, great. So then you feel like you don't need to tell them, mm-hmm. and you don't tell them, then they freak out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what's going on? Exactly. So. so at the very beginning when we were going that route of partnership, we were like we need to figure we just need it we just need straight private lenders because then they're giving us the money and if obviously we don't pay that payment each month they can foreclose on us Mm -hmm. which is never going to happen and never has happened but it's just easier we can get what we need to get done without all the little uh approvals you Mm -hmm. know and um so it it really slowed us down at the beginning and so we started to change our strategy and that's when we were like okay no more partnerships we really going forward just need to continue to do it this way and once we did that it started to get more systematic and quicker so what do you guys offer as far as interest rates? Anywhere from six to nine and a half, or nine point, or no, nine and a half, and we're, we're averaging what, like 8.25%? Yeah, that's probably be our average, okay. just depending on the deal. And that's yeah, what I tell everyone It always all the changes. Time. So um, we, a lot of these concepts when you're talking to a private lender are the same concepts that you have when you're like wholesaling. You know, when you're wholesaling, you're talking to a seller, and they usually aren't like, come by my house immediately, let's sign the contract. Mm -hmm. It's usually like a conversation and then you call them up again and there's another follow-up, then you finally go schedule the walkthrough and then there's another Mm follow-up, then there's another follow-up and then 10th communication, you finally get a deal done. It's very similar with these private lenders. You gotta talk to them, talk to them and you know, tell them what you're doing. And we like to, we have like a whole list of people that we're, you know, trying to attract as private money lenders. And we tell, we email blast them with updates of our next deal that we're looking at, you know, our finished product, our Facebook, all that. So they, we're always kind of in front of them. Um, Cause it might not work for them now. Like they might have their funds tied up in something else or mm-hmm. a different project. But then like when they see the email blast come out in four months and they have their money available, they're like, oh yes, let's go. I'm going to give this money back to them. Cause or, a lot of people are watching even if they ain't saying anything. Yeah, mm-hmm. they are. And so we, we present it in like, hey, this is a range of the interest rate. And then we tell them every deal is different. You know, every deal has a different rehab budget, uh, budget, a different valuation, it, you know, different purchase price that we've negotiated. It might be a wonderful purchase price, but cash flow is low on that one because of low, in, uh, low rental rates over there or whatever. So each one's a little bit different. And we do a, the math per property to, d- to determine 
what kind of interest rate we can pay on it. And then we put it out there, hey, this one we're paying 7%. This one pay- right. we're paying 8.75%. Right. And then people kind of raise their hands and then we you know, call through them and go from there. And even if we don't have a deal like like an actual deal that we're working or trying to find funds for, we're still calling and we're still trying to like touch base with people. And it's, and you know, too, it's not just about like, do you have money? Cause I want it. It's, mm-hmm. it's also like, just how are you doing? Let's just go grab coffee. Let's go grab lunch. Let's just have a relationship with each other. So right. um, we're constantly trying to build that rapport with people. And when the time is right for that person, we make it work, we'll figure it out. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, And sometimes when we get a really good deal or one that we really want, um, we'll contract and we don't necessarily have the private lenders in place place or not necessarily know how much money we're working with, but we know it's a slamming deal and we can make it work in whatever capacity. And then we'll just, on this specific deal, we'll just call down the list. Hey, Mm -hmm. we haven't talked in a while, where you at? I got this great one, let's look at it together. I'm gonna send you the email, let's look at the numbers or the photos or do you wanna go look at it with me or whatever. And then try and, get some interest right there on the spot. It's all about planting the seeds. Do you guys have like a, or do you or your clients have like an LTV, like where they feel comfortable investing? So honestly, our private lenders really don't. They, uh, as far as numbers and all those different components or the intricacies of it, there are some private lenders that are very particular and they're very savvy and maybe they were old investors themselves and they have uh, specific guidelines. Mm -hmm. But honestly, most of our investors are just, it's a pure trust thing because we've really built the relationship with them that they just, hey, you think it's a good one? All right, we're following you. How much do you need? Okay, great. So they'll fund 100% of it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. They'll fund the purchase, the rehab, and closing costs for us. And sometimes we'll get even a little bit more. But LTV-wise, I originally started when we were running our numbers was 80%, but I've kind of bumped it down a little bit to 78%. So we don't get a loan any more than 78% uh, LTV. And then our target is always to get everything included in that amount. And so that's- Why 78 versus 80? Well, I was just, when it comes to the refinance component and the exit and um, just looking from a long-term perspective, I wanted to have a little bit more cushion room in there for all of us because mm-hmm. it better protects us, you know, in our exit, but it honestly better protects the lender too. And I felt 80 was a little bit too close to that fringe of uh, pushing the numbers and I didn't want to be putting ourselves in that position, but also our lenders. And so that what was- What position kinda, are you putting yourself in? Well, just in a situation that, hey, what if there's a downturn in the market or whatever, and, you know, you know, values drastically drop or, you know, just worst case scenarios like mm-hmm. that. So um, we just want to put ourselves in uh, a good position for all scenarios. So we gotcha. thought that was a little bit more of a, a little bit better conservative number compared to the 80%. So that's gotcha. how that frame of thinking came. Uh, so you guys have your, your wholesaling side and you have your buy and hold side. I'm imagining that your buy and hold side is being fueled or being fed by the wholesale side. Yep. Yeah, partially. Partially. Yeah, we don't find everything for Bella buyers or buy and hold portfolio from Hillco. We we get a lot of stuff from other uh, wholesalers as well in the area. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, but they usually know of us because we're so involved in the wholesaling mm-hmm. realm right. or they'll come through our wholes- wholesale. But we've phone. definitely picked up our own Hillco deals. So, so it's nice. It's when like you guys do circle. that, what kind of assignment fee do you guys pay yourselves? Uh, so the way the way we've done it on that side is actually we've opened it up to um, everybody in our Hilco Homes, our wholesaling company, to be able to take advantage of purchasing the properties that come through the funnel. Mm-hmm. And then what we basically do is we look at what um, the property would sell for from an assign- assignment standpoint, and then um, break up the numbers uh, based on that. So for instance, for our acquisition team, we have them making 35% of the uh, assignment fee. For our disposition it's people- really high. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. We, we're pretty generous. <laughs> uh, uh, for our disposition people, we have them paying 15, per, or get paid 15%, and then our portion is 50%. So if we acquire our own property based on that, well, we're kind of getting a 50% discount on right. the amount. So that's kind of how we make sure it's a good deal. And same for the acquisition person. We still make sure they get paid. Yeah, the acquisition person, they get like that 35% discount based on what the assignment fee would be. Yeah, because we have in our contract, the way we have it written up is if one of us takes it down, we still have to pay the average assignment fee Mm -hmm. to the team. There you go, yeah. Before you have the right to take it down. Yeah, exactly. Um, So you mentioned something earlier about mental blocks and getting over it. 
Was there something that you did to get over your mental blocks? Good question. I don't even know if I know this. Uh, so particularly when it came to, uh, obviously action is the true um, mm -hmm. breakthrough. Um, there's a lot of things that tell you or in your head that you'll tell yourself. You'll come up with your own excuses to stop you. There's a lot of BS we put in our heads. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's a lot. A of us lot. Yeah. It, it's, it's just rationalizing <laughs> situations. For me, the big the big change was when um, when we both quit together and I said, all right, I have to make this happen for us because I was kind of leading us based on my experience. I had so, to put complete like faith and trust into him because well, I didn't I didn't know real estate at that time. I knew he did. I, he was doing it, but I didn't know anything about it. And I had to like really also step up my game and read a lot and learn a lot and go to seminars and like get on board very quickly. She did the while being track, pregnant while being pregnant, yes. <laughs> yeah. which wasn't the easiest. Uh, but honestly, a big component was, OK, I, you know, I really I actually implemented something then that I've done every year that's really helped is I created a, um, a resolution document that uh, we actually both uh, work on mm -hmm. at the beginning of each year. Because, again, we timed this kind of for January 1st, 2016. Mm -hmm. So we made a resolution document, and it, our documents are like nine pages long, ten pages long of like all the things we want to And we are constantly going in and changing it and editing it. And yeah, and so we look at that every week, and it's in Google Drive, and it's a living document. I think a big mistake that a lot of people make is they write, and I had done this so many times, because when you go to seminars, you read books, it's like, write your goals down. Well, we write them down, but then usually that goes in a drawer, or you know, it's in that binder that you never really, you had that fresh binder for the seminar, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that collecting dust. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we put it in Google Drive. It's a living, breathing, evolving document. We look at it every single week together. Well, sometimes not together, but we look at it every single week, and we're always kind of tweaking it and adjusting it. So that was really huge. And then the other big component was changing my conversation that I was having with the people around me. That was big. What I had been doing up until this point was always um, motivated with the thought process of trying to sell a deal. You know, are you buying right now? What are you looking for? What's your, you know, what what kind of numbers are you looking for? Do you buy in this zip code? What what about this deal or over here? Mm -hmm. You know, are you wholesaler? Are you a buyer? Do you buy? In that was always the conversation I was having. I was having a wholesaler conversation. When my true goals was, I wanted to be an investor. So then I started changing the conversation I was having with everybody. Not only the people I was calling down the list, but when I was going to networking events, the people that I've known for so many uh, years, mm -hmm. our family members we had conversations with, and the conversation now was, we are going to buy properties. It's going to happen. We're looking for people to kind of join us on this journey and who'd be interested and potentially can participate, mainly in a private lending scenario, mm -hmm. but maybe there's other ways it could fit together. And that was a big... Uh, change for me and then once we got our first deal I was like hey we can do this and then the momentum goes from there because then you see the truth the, or the reality that can come from just going down that path and taking the actions yeah that uh. actually, I was just gonna say like that first year I mean we did better than I even thought we could and well, well not that we had <laughs> I had such lack of faith that's, I re that wasn't that, that didn't come out correctly I mean I was just like surprised because once we actually started doing it it was like oh this isn't as difficult as I thought it was like well, we it was a big it change together. for her too like I, I was have the mindset like, I'm going from wholesaler to investor which is kind of just a step over she was going from secure f a job 401k to no now raising job. private money I've never for not deals. had so the job big, so it was really hard for me there. And All I was right. also scared, too, because it wasn't just me. Like, I know we can live pretty frugally, you know, but I'm like, I know kids are expensive and it's coming. And <laughs> and we didn't know. <laughs> we, we were not prepared for this little child and how much attitude she has. She's got so much <laughs> attitude. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so you guys have when when what, what was the exact date that you guys made the transition where you guys both quit your jobs? It was in, uh, she quit uh, in, in October. We, in October. I quit in November. And then our oh, plan. 2015. 2015. 2015. Okay. And our plan was to start January 1, 2016. So you guys acquired, you said, close to 50 mm -hmm. units. Yes. And then you guys have sold since. So talk about that. Uh, you know, when you said, I'm going to start acquiring properties, like what was the objective? Do you guys have like a perfect home when you guys are buying the properties? Like what are you guys, what's the box you guys are trying to fit it in? Well, it's been evolving. And even now we're in a kind of a transition phase uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. When we were first looking for deals, um, we were just trying to get 
the cheapest deal possible so that we could, uh, the money that we raised could cover as much as possible because we didn't want to come out of pocket at all. Mm -hmm. So the first deal we did, we got it for purchase price of 30,000. And I think we put like five or eight grand, maybe even less into it. Yeah, it was actually really nice already. We didn't really need to do much. So we kind of looked out on that. Right. And then our second deal was a sub two. So it was in the beginning phase, it was like just any deal we can get where we're not coming out of pocket. Then it transitioned to, okay, now we want to uh, acquire properties, rehab them, and then sell them owner finance mm -hmm. because we saw the benefit of collecting the down payment, which could be sizable. And uh, the fact that once you have a note, you know, you don't have to worry about maintenance and those mm -hmm. type of things. So that was our next transition. Uh, and in that arena, we were probably floating at an ARV of like 145 and less. Um, but then our first year of taxes, we realized that owner finance isn't the best route for the tax bill at the end of the year. And we needed, again, our mentality has been like trying to keep as much of our funds in these early phases as possible. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, we transitioned to rental real estate. And our, we still try and keep to that 150 ARV and less because the cash flow spreads better in that lower range. Mm -hmm. And these are San Antonio numbers, by the way. Yeah. San Antonio <laughs> overall, I think the median is like 215 or something for a single family home. But um, I would say our, our most expensive house uh, ARV are like 260, but that was a rarity. I think our average yeah. is probably like um, 150 range, 150 to 170 range yeah. and less. Mm -hmm. But we always try and go on the lower end because yeah. we're trying to get cash flows. Yeah. So you mentioned the tax consequences of owner financing. I don't think anyone's ever talked about that, at least on this show. What are tax consequences of being owner financing? The higher capital gains. So you. So uh, you I, so we, uh, we're not tax professionals. That's probably our weakest spot. But we but spend a lot of time trying to learn. I pay a lot of it. <laughs> and paid a lot of money learning. <laughs> yeah. um, so our initial impression was um, we would get capital gains tax, which you can't avoid on, um, that I'm aware of, you can't avoid uh, on an owner finance note. And we thought we would only get that percentage deducted from the down payment we collected. So if um, if it was $10,000 down payment, we thought we were paying the capital gains percentage on that ten grand turns out you actually pay the capital gains on the difference between what you sell it for the sales price and in a lot of cases you're like trying to push that as high as possible mm -hmm. um, either that or the interest rate but you, you pay uh, the difference between uh, the sales price and what your all-in number is so if you have a big spread if you were purchase it, you rehab it and you're all in for 80,000 and then you sell you turn around and you sell it for you know, 125, you're paying capital gains on that 45,000, even though you might've got a 10 grand down payment. So you didn't realize the gain, no. mm -hmm. but you're still paying taxes yeah. on mm -hmm. the gain. Yes. So, and because you're considered, uh, when you're, um, when the IRS looks at you, you fall in one or two categories. You're either an investor or a dealer. And an investor is somebody who intends to hold a property. For at least a year in cash year, flow, right. like buy and hold. Right, and the, and the intends part is kind of the gray area. And Very there's gray. a lot of gray areas. <laughs> yeah, there's gray. a lot of people that kind of dance that line for sure. And I then, know a lot that do. Yeah. yeah. And then the dealer is somebody who... Uh, is a flipper, owner, finance, Right, they basically seller. view you as uh, selling inventory, and your mm -hmm. inventory is the quick turnaround on the property. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in that category, you, you're exposed more to the full capital gains, where there's more tax incentives if you're on the investor side. Right. So... We didn't when know we that. found that out, <laughs> surprise. And I think we had already uh, done four owner finances at the time. Right. So the first year was a little like, so oh. Pay mm -hmm. capital gains on like 100 grand that you don't have. Yeah, right. exactly. So, so we changed our strategy. So now we hold everything for minimum of a year. Mm -hmm. And we try and line up. Actually, we try and line up all of our tenants to be out like the end of April. So that April we have time. Is all of our leases. We try and line them all up so that we have time to either renew again for another year if we really like the tenant or we're not ready to sell that property or we have them move out. We clean it up a little bit if it needs some like, you know, make ready. And then we put it on the market to sell, which I'm a realtor. So. We, I list my You're own You're a badass stuff. realtor. I don't like being a realtor. No, she doesn't. I don't <laughs> like, I do it for us. Or He's a broker, you can't say or that. Or friends and family. <laughs> it's totally okay. Uh, I do it very minimally. So because of the, the capital gains consequences of doing Southern Carry, you guys went more on the buy and hold, or holding it for a year. Mm -hmm. 
are you guys trying to do a seller carry then if you guys aren't listing it? That's an opportunity. But no, actually, now what we're trying to do is uh, we're slowly selling our properties. And we've sold a good amount. And we're slowly mm -hmm. selling our properties. Originally, it was just to get more properties. But now we're selling our properties to try and get into small multifamily properties. And starting to go the 1030 ro 1031 exchange right. route. We haven't done 1031 as a part of our strategy yet, just because uh, when we sell the pro sell the properties and the equity get, we still kind of need to touch that so we can kind of feed our wholesaling business and try and acquire more properties. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to, we're getting close to the point to where we won't need to touch that any that money anymore, and then we'll our game plan is buy a property, hold it at least a year, uh, either refinance it or sell it. Probably more selling it, so we can get more equity. When we sell it, use 1031 so that we can roll all that money tax deferred free into small multifamily. Mm -hmm. Basically, get off get rid of all of our houses and start moving into the multifamily realm. That's our gotcha. current game plan right now. How often are you guys revising your game plan? All the time, well, seems like. <laughs> well, at the beginning, all the time. We've kind of, I don't know, we haven't Probably really revised like, much recently. I think recently. a major shift maybe every six months to a year realm now at this we point. We always try and revisit the goals, though, for yeah, sure. Yeah, like look at our numbers, look at our new You have to be open to the change. You have to be open to things shifting because, I mean, if you get stuck in that mindset of, like, this is what we had planned, like, years ago, I mean, you have to have room for That's growth. That's so true. All right. Because I mean, we really came into this whole thing back in the end of 2015 with this plan. Well, that's changed so many times, and you kind of have to just be comfortable and okay with, like, going in a direction you weren't thinking you were going to go in because it's going to now be what's best for everybody or you. I mean, what we do is not best for everybody out there. Well, I mean, the world is around us and the market that we're um, dealing in is always changing and in, in influx. But then there's the component that we as individuals are changing our status. You know, we're growing a lot in this section. Maybe we didn't grow as much over here. You know, um, our, our goals, our wants change and evolve. So um, having a reflection consistently, and that's why I mentioned that we look at our resolution document very, very frequently, helps put in perspective of what we wanted and whether or not we still want to go down that path. And gotcha. it's not even just business, it's also personal stuff. So just goals we want to accomplish together as a family or individually. And yeah. we really try and push ourselves to like accomplish those goals. Yeah, actually these concepts that uh, apply to business, we've tried to stretch them in our entire life. Cause we're, you know, our, the only reason for us anyway, that we're trying to be successful in business is so that we can have a successful and fulfilled life that, mm -hmm. um, it creates experiences that we enjoy and that are memorable and fulfilling and increases the frequency of those experiences. So as an example, also in that resolution document are not business items, but fun items. So for instance, at the beginning of 2019, before we got to January 1st, we already picked out all the things we wanted to do for the year or a grand idea of them and put them in the calendar. So we had all of 2019 planned out, planned out. <laughs> as far as weekends and, and things and go. And then as time goes by, it manipulates and change. And mm -hmm. we're like, you know what? That, probably is going to suck. Let's not do that. Or, or we don't have babysitting, so we have to like change change it up a little bit. But. For instance, we're going to go to a wine stomp two weekends from now. Yeah, Which I've never done. You, did I've you? done it like once. And it, it was sounded fun. like fun, right? It was fun, yeah. <laughs> well, that didn't sound very confident. Now I'm second But like, guessing. like we have like <laughs> things out, like just things we've always wanted to do together. So we have to make sure if we don't have it written down somewhere, we will forget about it. And then we might not remember about right. it for five years. So... <laughs> So we, Everything's we do right. a lot of planning. We do, yeah. yeah. To the dismay of Hillary sometimes. She loves to be spontaneous. I like both. I like both. Yeah, you have to have the best of both worlds. That's right. You need a little spontane spontaneity in your life. Uh, so how much wholesaling are you guys doing right now? We're about five a month, five plus a month on our wholesaling team. We're ha we have like four this week, which is stressing me out a little bit. Why? Just because I'm here. <laughs> I'm on my phone all like all day today. I've been on my phone like making sure deals are closing tomorrow and Friday. But it's it's a definitely a good thing to have. Yeah, it's a great problem. It's a great problem. So yeah. you mentioned earlier you see you got like eleven people in your office. Like what so what does your organization look like today? The two of us. I do mm -hmm. all the closings for the team. So basically I make sure we have all the correct documentation, don't want to get in any lawsuits, so I make sure we do it no. correctly. She's we a have documentation it all there. Nazi. I am, but it's like if 
I just don't want to do it the wrong way because the one time you don't do it correctly is the one time that you're going to get threatened with a lawsuit. So I make sure we do it right each time, even if the rest of the team hates that I'm constantly nagging them. Um, and I also make sure that the closings, we get to the closing table. So anything that title needs, if there's affidavit of airships or death certificates or whatever it's going to be, I make sure we get that stuff taken care of. And then we have um, a systems and CRM guy. He does all our reporting Plecto, Podio, I mean, he's kind of a little bit of everything. Our website, he does a lot of our podcasts. And mm -hmm. Then we have and uh, one in-house realtor who kind of does all the retail side. So if it's a, uh, a lead that comes in that we can't wholesale or it's just the numbers are off, then he'll get the lead and try and work it from an agent standpoint. Or we just need an agent. Like, for instance, we we had a deal that was a mm -hmm. short sale situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we needed an agent. He was our yeah, okay. hopefully we can close that one. It's been kind of a nightmare. And then we've got one dispositions and then the rest are acquisition. So, right. oh, and we have a VA. Yeah. So you guys are saying earlier 35%, which is the most generous I think I've ever heard. Oh, yeah? Well, we're generous people. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you hear that we try out there? And, yeah, you hear that team? <laughs> now, everyone in San Antonio, like, why? <laughs> there you go. All right. Yes, um, exactly. So what does your... Actually, quick comment on that. Yeah. Okay. So... When I originally started, I started as an agent, and uh -huh. um, I was, like, barely making it. Acquisition agent or a licensed realtor? A uh, licensed realtor. Okay. I wasn't wholesaling. I okay. was representing investors acquiring properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these are, like, $60,000 houses or less, so 3% of those is, like, very, very <laughs> little. But in addition to that, I had, first off, 40% of that, of the commission for an agent, went to uh, the investor depending on what level they were, okay? They got like a rebate. Then what was remained, I did a 30-70 split and then I oh, got 70. So after, rough. I think when I did the math, I got less than half of the commission. Mm -hmm. That's really and I was rough. barely making it. So I remember that and I remember one of the big frustrations I had with that and I, it was, uh, you know, I went through some hard times not making it and I was really depressed in a lot of ways and not motivated and that always stuck with me. So I always wanted to make sure that if they were part of our team that, um, yeah, I wanted to make sure they make good money monetarily, but I was also going to help them become investors themselves. So up until all the companies I've been a part of, not, they didn't really focus on the employees or the people on in the company acquiring their own properties. It mm -hmm. was always focusing on the clients getting their properties. And I remember that. So those were two really big sticking points for me particularly. So when we were building our company, that was something that was important. I think that's honorable. Okay, well, great. Still think it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so let's talk about the responsibilities of the of, the, of your acquisition people. Okay. Right, like, so what do they do on a transaction? Like, what are, their, what are their responsibilities as an acquisition agent? Everything on the front end, really. Everything that has to do with the seller. So Take the lead, work the lead, get the appointment, get the contract signed, get all the documentation. So cultivating the lead themselves. Sometimes they're handed a lead from mailers or mm -hmm. things like that, but they generate their own leads. All the negotiation with the seller, uh, walk on the properties, uh, evaluating the properties, and then getting it to contract. And then uh, beyond that point, they really just are kind of maintaining the point of contact with the seller. They'll help with any uh, curative work on title if needed and uh, schedule closing on the seller side. That's probably the extent of their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the disposition is responsible for what? Same thing, but in reverse. So anything on the back end, they find they, they sell the contract to an investor. They find the investor who wants to purchase the contract, get all the documentation, and then also coordinate anything with the buyer on the back end. Um, They'll handle our email blast, our text blast, our you know systems to get the word out. They'll out call there. Out they'll call all the investors, investors schedule all the showings, uh, negotiate with the the investors, and um, contract with the investors. And then if we need to get prepared for closing, they'll make sure the investor gets LLC docs to title or, you know, they'll communicate with the lender, the lender or the buyer if needed to help make sure everything's... So they have a little bit of a TC role, transaction coordinator role. A little bit. A little bit. So Hillary... So I don't really have communication with any buyers or sellers just since I don't I wasn't the one that built relationships with either side. I kind of just tell them what is needed and then they go after and get those items. But once they get them, they hand them off to me 
and then I am the sole person speaking with title just because we had it at the very beginning when we didn't have very many people where there was no transaction coordinator and so there was a lot of people like there were too many hands in the pot and I was like I I was like, Title's not only working on our files. So like, because they're probably getting so many emails from different people, we had to systemize that process. And so now anything communicated with Title comes through me. So I'm the one really building the rapport with these Title people. And then she like hands the assignments out to the acquisition person or disposition person. But gotcha. I keep it all very organized. So if anyone needs documentation or what's going on from months ago, because we still haven't closed this file, I have like super, I'm like yeah. the most organized on the, the team. Whip. And I'm like, we needed it like four months ago. <laughs> uh, Charles Hernandez suggests teaming up with HBHS. Um, you and need to get them on the show. Uh, yeah, they're, they're awesome. awesome. I'd love to do it. Uh, and then Hernando Aker says that the, the fee is generous and fair. He's, he's on our team. He was one of our <laughs> so like. I think we just messaged him. He was say one that. of our like top fans back when we were doing a lot of yeah, Facebook actually, Live, and yeah. then he joined us. Awesome. Yeah, he was always on our Facebook Lives, and then he ended up applying, and now he he kind of runs our team for us. Oh, that's the awesome. acquisition yeah. side, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Uh, you mentioned your VA. What do they do? Oh gosh, she does like everything. I don't even know all of the things she does. She's so she. Uh, we try and hand everything. Everyone has access to her. <coughs> We try and uh, give her all the responsibilities for the time-consuming elements. So she facilitates email blasts, text blasts. She's the one that updates our website. Um, she also uh, will compile our lists or um, you know remove return mail, all like the data entry type mm -hmm. stuff. She'll also kind of navigate in Podio and keep in good communication. So all the little tedious elements she does. Um, we. We're actually going to try and incorporate it to where she is assisting Hillary more on the title side. Yeah. So I can step out a little bit. Yeah. And ultimately, we need to get to a point with either her or maybe another VA where they can actually draft the documentation uh, for our team, too, because that's always a time consuming part that we've noticed. But we're not quite at that point yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what marketing techniques are working best for you guys? Our number one is co wholesaling. So we try and um, we try and do a lot of social media, a lot of Facebook. Um, we're getting better at the Instagram. I just said the Instagram. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're trying to do more uh, social media wise. And because of that, particularly in San Antonio, um, we know a lot of other wholesalers are pretty integrated with the market. We know uh, all pretty much the major, major players, but also a lot of the people trying to get into wholesaling um, watch our videos and interact with us so they'll bring us deals. So either establish wholesalers or investors that come across a wholesale potential or new wholesalers, a lot of them bring deals to us and that, I would say that's our number one source. Aside from that, we do uh, direct mail. We do generate. Yeah. Well, we do band sites too. And we'll do and some door mean, knocking. Yeah, but we'll do a little bit of everything. We, but number two, I would say yeah. is direct mail. So are you guys doing any cold calling? Oh yeah, we do a lot of cold calling too. Gotcha. So maybe actually, let me reverse. We'll do uh, co wholesaling, cold calling, then uh, mm -hmm. direct mail. Gotcha. Um, and as far as markets, you guys are exclusively in San Antonio. Primarily, mm -hmm. we have done some other markets, but it's not very often. We've closed closed a couple deals in Memphis. Um, I mean, Dallas, all, Houston, yeah, we, around. We're, but we're not like pursuing those deals. If an opportunity comes up, um, we'll try and make a deal happen or whatever. But San Antonio by far is our focus. Gotcha. And how much are you guys spending a month on marketing? Probably about five grand. Right and, around there, give or take. And most of that's going to? Uh, direct mail. Yeah. And, they'll, you know, and then we also, on top of that, have all the different subscriptions, which that adds up for sure. I don't know if they can $39 a year a month to death. Yeah, that's yes. true. <laughs> uh, Pay for the year for the discount. <laughs> uh, how's your monthly overhead? Uh, I don't know what our monthly overhead is. I can tell you, but um, we do have an office. Uh, we do have a lot of the subscriptions. Uh, like I said, we we do a lot to um, do more of the inexpensive leads. So the cold call selling is really big, and then cold calling uh, really isn't too um, money intensive. So we don't have like the largest overhead in the world, and then with it's Bella, not too bad. Yeah, and then with Bella Buyers, it's just us, and yeah, there really isn't really any overhead. That's also there. why we take fifty percent because we need obviously to pay for these things. Yeah, we have to pay for the team. Are you saying we need to take more? I know. Well, maybe we should. 
I didn't say that <laughs> we exactly. Re- we should revisit <laughs> after this meeting. Sounded something like it. Um, so uh, any valuable resources? Um, like you recommend tools, programs, systems? Well, what are some systems you well, can live without? We actually, well, I don't, the team doesn't really use it, but Marco and I are always in Trello. I don't know if you've heard of it, mm-hmm. but it's we constantly live in Trello. We have we share the same stuff and we task each other and live off. Of, I don't know how many times a day we look at that stuff because if we didn't have it, we would I would forget everything I need to do. Yeah. And we have like different columns, so like what's critical, what's something we need to do eventually, but not like completely critical and. I can see what he's got on his task. So if there's anything I can jump in and help him accomplish, just and to I help tell him her, speed don't him mess up. with any of my stuff. <laughs> don't <laughs> Unless touch I any do of it for him, <laughs> then he's oh, happy. Okay, you can definitely touch those. <laughs> yeah. So I would say Trello, but like our, the rest of our Actually, team doesn't yeah, really use it. By far, but number one. But in Trello. Hilco, our team, we we have Podio as our CRM. We use Plucto for reporting. We have Slack. We constantly Slack are in, is we're, we're constantly one. in Slack with each other. Slack is a, just a communication platform, just like a great opportunity to do like a bunch of group text messages, really yeah. organized, and we use that a lot. And we have specific channels for different things, so you know kind of where to put it in, so there's always a way of tracking a conversation or whatever. Uh, um, so some of the leads that we, uh, there's one website, I think it's Vacant Home Data Feed. Mm-hmm. I have to double check VHDF, that. VHDF, yeah, Cameron. Yeah, that um, can't remember his last name. That one's great uh, for leads, and we've used that a lot, and that one's been good for direct mail. Um, we're just now starting to incorporate uh, REI Pro. Uh, we haven't, th- that's like actually happening right now, so mm-hmm. I don't really have the experience in, in it fully. We just did our first campaigns with it this week, um, but we're incorporating that, and um, we have a bunch of just other subscriptions. DocuSign, we use a bunch, you know, pretty the standard ones. Uh, you mentioned coal wholesaling earlier as one of your is your primary mm-hmm. or is your best. So talking about coal wholesaling, how are you building out coal wholesaling? Like what are your strategies to become because there's no shortage of, of wholesalers that someone goes to, right? I think New Western's pretty popular. Yeah. yeah in there. Texas. Yeah. yeah. Not really liked. Uh, so there's <laughs> lots we, of I like New Western. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but there's a lot of different options out there. So like why go to Marco or Hillary? Uh I we do it. Because we're nice. We're fun loving. Well, half we of like us to are have nice. fun. I don't know which half. I can be nice. <laughs> I didn't You're say on anything. My good side. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Just bring her some uh, good cookies or something, then she'll really like you. Yeah. Yeah. Any particular flavor? Just anything nice uh, anything. would be good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Co wholesaling, we do a lot of social media. Mm-hmm. So we put out a lot of free content, and I think that's a way that um, really has helped bring in a lot of leads, especially mm-hmm. with. There are a ton of people out there who are trying to get into wholesaling. They've watched this show. They've watched all, a bunch of other content out there, and they've taken steps to generate leads. And you know they've done a lot already. And um, there's just a, a few pieces here and there that they're missing, mm-hmm. or there's stuff that they just don't know they don't know. And we found that a lot of people who have come to us and said, "Hey, I think I have a lead," or "Here's like a list of leads," or whatever, yeah. that they have like a golden nugget sitting right there, and they just didn't know it, or maybe they were too scared to take the action or make the phone call or whatever. So we put a lot of content out there to kind of promote, like, "Hey, if you have a deal, bring it to us," and you know, we don't necessarily have to work together. We'd be glad to give you you know, information on like how to proceed forward. But what we found is a lot of people are just like, you know what, you know, let's definitely work together. So that's been one way in itself. But aside from that, I mean, we just trying, we're all about relationship building. So, you know, like Mike and Aaron and Quentin and all those people, we've done deals with all of them. And uh, actually Aaron, we're closing one tomorrow, whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, just building those relationships, touching base with them, having fun with them, non-business stuff, you know, just, keeping that connection strong is critical and you never know how you're going to overlap. It's always doing right by people too That's because people price. are very like short-sighted and it's all about the money for some people but I'd rather take less money on a deal knowing we can do more deals in the future than like trying to get every penny we can get just because if you do that if you do it that way then you might not get deals in the future so it's it's really just about it's really just about doing right by people and that's a huge and being more far-sighted like we yeah. like I want to be knowing these people for years not trying to just suck people dry too many people that's like a big mistake is they get wrapped up in like closing that deal especially when you're new you're desperate and especially when they're big 
assignment fees. Yeah, that's true too. If it's like a two thousand dollars assignment fee, you don't really care. But like twenty grand plus, you get greedy. Yeah, it's like I want every penny. (laughs) I have to come down five hundred to make it. Yeah, just do it. (laughs) Like it's yeah. Uh, What is uh, your guys' why? Our why I think primarily is so that we can retire early and be out of the rat race and travel and. I mean, honestly, it all comes like, back to the concept in Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is a really simple concept. If you can generate enough passive income to cover your needs and wants, then you're free. And so we're working to get free and we want to become free where we're not controlled, tied to money um, so that the family that we're building we can go on long trips together, build memories together. I can like here we are in Arizona, and I didn't have to ask anyone permission to not be in the office. But I had to all. ask her permission. <laughs> <laughs> but so. I mean, like you know, when you when you are used to like a, a regular job, and you have to build up your PTO or vacation hours, and you know, and I remember I remember being in that in that role and not being very happy and feeling depressed. Like, oh, it's Sunday and I have to go to work for forty hours this week, and it's just like that mundane. You know, you dreaded Sundays. Right? I hated. Well, it was just like just a sad. It was just like you know, you're good at what you do, but you don't really find any passion in it or enjoyment in it, and it being the controlling factor in your life. Like, I need to go to the doctor, but I don't have. You know, you're trying to figure it out, or just like anything. Like, I hated that part about having a real job. So, I really like where we're at, even though it's hard. We're, what we're doing is hard work right now. It's still better than where we were a couple years ago. Do you have a metric? for when you guys feel that you guys can retire? The number I wrote down was $12,916.67. Because <laughs> we did the math uh, when we first started and that's 155,000 divided by 12. Mm-hmm. And so that was the number that we were um, that we were shooting towards. We're definitely not there yet, um, but that's you know the first main goal. I'm sure once we get there, you know, she, she'll want a bigger more. number or something, but. Uh, Every uh, time we'll be like, we want that. Not that's not like that's not like the forever goal. That's like a, the first goal to be like. <laughs> See already. That's like the first goal to be like. <laughs> the first main goal. We can breathe and like not be so worried about. But everything. we want that from our properties, not from our wholesaling. Right. Which you passive. know that, that could be passive income that's, too if you build the business. Um, but it's from our from properties. strictly cash flow. If we can bring that in every month. That's what we'll we're be riding towards. easy. Yeah, or easier. Gotcha. What is your biggest struggle right now? Kids. Dang, you said that so fast. (laughs) She was ready for that question. It's just really hard. Like, we've had so many conversations where we talk to each other and we're like, we just got to get through these couple years because this is the hardest we are ever going to have to live this life. Like, building a business from scratch, trying to keep a team motivated, trying to keep ourselves motivated, and having two little tiny babies. I mean, we have two that are three and under. So it's just, it's a lot. It's just it's hard it's really hard <laughs> it it's, uh, puts pressure on a relationship mm-hmm. aside from business you know just having our own time to be able to, I mean date nights and that's like to, really important to me and we get maybe once a month if we're lucky yeah I mean <laughs> th- those fundamental components just to keep a relationship happy it, a lot of that goes to the wayside when you have children unless you have help in some capacity so we've really had to learn to ask for help which you know for me I was a very kind of like I want to shoulder I want to I'm independent I want to do it on my own and you know that's naive in some ways it's we got okay to a point to where we help. had a conversation and we were like we just need to ask both of our parents for help like mm-hmm. it it just got too difficult where we weren't getting anything done and we just had to say you know let's swallow our pride and say we need some help can you at least commit to like one day or a couple nights for babysitting and uh, she says kids but really kids is what um, highlights what the true problem is and the true problem is the limited amount of time that we have mm-hmm. and whether or not we're trying to apply that time to being productive or you know you know making sure our relationship is healthy or whatever so our biggest problem is just like um, being able to set ourselves up to where we can kind of control our time more we're not working in the business um, as much as we sh- we are we're the bottleneck in some instances so we're really trying to make a transition now to kind of delegate more, 
give more responsibilities to the team members, trust more, mm-hmm. um, you know, the stronger systems. Even in our home life, we're trying to get a nanny now. Yeah, that's hard for me. The trust is hard. Somebody to clean the home so we don't do that. And I mean, concepts in the four hour work week. Mm-hmm. So that's our weakness. And that's what we're trying right now. We're trying to really focus on and fix. Well, I like that you brought that up, though, because, you know, one of the things that was important to me, having you both on the show was, you know, the challenges as a as a power couple, right? Like a lot of times we have like one person who has uh, a guy or, 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 or a woman, but you know, they're kind of doing one thing. She's but all the power in this relationship. <laughs> but having a couple, like you get to really hear like some of the other challenges, mm-hmm. trying to run a business as two people versus just one person. Mm-hmm. And something we did uh, that she made us do uh, because she wanted to make sure our relationship was really strong was she suggested when we first oh yeah uh, started dating like literally like within a month of us dating uh, to read we the both, five, yeah. five love languages we both read that book which was it's kind of like the rich dad poor dad of relationships and yeah. so just being mindful of you know how she perceives love and how I perceive love and how I can fulfill her needs and wants and same in reverse because not everybody needs the same thing or responds to the same thing. And so trying to be mindful of that. Given and we read all that a long time ago, but we actually try and reread it every so often just to like refresh, you know, cause I mean, especially with two kids and a business, it's like, you haven't fulfilled my love tank in a while. And so it's like, you have to take a step back and not take offense to that, but like really just think about like, oh, have I not done what he needs or has he not done what I need just to feel loved, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Maybe it's not like this grand gesture of like, let's go to the nicest, most expensive getaway weekend, but it's maybe it's just something small like, oh, I came home from work and here's a gift I thought about you. Even if it's just like a love letter, like it doesn't even have to be monetary or expensive. It it just needs to be something that he thought of Um, and vice versa. Like he loves when I do things around the house for him and whatever. So it's like just making sure you're in tune with that. And honestly, that's, for us, the most important component. We have to make sure that our relationship is strong and that she's happy and I'm happy because everything is a tangent from that. Our, ch- our children are a tangent from our happiness in the world or the household that we're bringing them up in. Same with our business, being able to function well and communicate well. You know, we can't be pissed off at each other, but then I need to go talk to her, what's the title update on this one? You know what I mean? <laughs> and she's like, get out of here, I don't want to talk to you. I so think it's really critical too, because we are together so much that we work on our relationship like we do. Like we really have to figure each other out and communicate. communication's key um, because we are together so much. Yeah. And if we don't like each other, then it, it's really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll have meetings where it's just her and I, and we'll just talk about anything and everything and just kind of Revisit that fresh, resolution fresh stage. Concepts, yeah. 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 So, Fire Language is Love. I think that's a great book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm in the middle of something else right now. I can't remember the full title, but it's something along the lines of um, uh, how to fix your marriage without talking about it, or how to make oh, a stronger marriage without talking about it. I've never heard of it. it. We'll have no. to look that so up. So, I'm kind of in the middle of that, and that's got some really powerful concepts in there as too. Okay. Looking at all the fights that we've had that were completely unnecessary. <laughs> Um, I think that's every relationship, learn, though, because we still sometimes have, like, completely unnecessary fights, and it's probably just, like, a long day, or the kids are extra frustrating, or something. Well, the book provides great insights as to why those things happened. That's the good, underlying components. Yeah, things yeah, that you we'll don't... have to look that up. ...that you didn't think were happening. Um, so I'll let you guys think about a last thought. Uh, guys, everyone is lo- uh, listening right now. So my business partner, Max, and I, uh, we're doing a two-day workshop this coming September limited access to a select group of people. If you want to qualify, see if you can come to our workshop, please go to disruptors.com. And then I'll be speaking in Houston, October 4th to 6th for Wholescaling Live. If you want to register for that, go to wholescalinglive.com, put R-E-D for 25% off. And I'll also be in Biloxi, Mississippi, October 25th to 27th for Real Estate Roundup Live. Uh, go to bit.ly, B-I-T L-Y slash R-E-R live uh, to register for that. If you guys want to hang, uh, visit in Mississippi and tomorrow, we have Jeremy Tag coming in from Richland, Washington. And two weeks from today, we're going to have the legendary Sean Terry. So that's going to be awesome. So last thoughts. So this is exciting. Uh, next few weeks and months for you. That yeah. whole scaling is going to be a good one. That's going to be good. That's a crazy, crazy lineup. Yeah, there is a lot of great people in that one. Yeah. So what was the question? I missed it. Last he thoughts. Didn't give it to us yet. Last thoughts. No, no, that's, you okay. guys got to give your last thoughts. Oh, we just give our last thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to leave the listeners with. I guess I missed that. We're very prepared. Um, well, I don't know. Oh, here, I'll spot. go first. Okay, you go first. I need it. to think about it. <laughs> um, 
overall, uh, if there's big components, I would say from this one, we covered a lot of topics. Number one, uh, your biggest decision by far is your partner. Uh, not just like in business, which that's huge in itself, but um, your romantic partner is your partner in life. Picking that wise to where you have good communication and you start off with good communication is fundamental and really can allow you, open the doors and allow you to accomplish some big things when you're bringing in both your knowledge, experience, and resources together. Definitely, if you have some sort of uh, mental blocks and you know what they are, People listening, I knew that they were at the time, mm -hmm. and I, you know, reflecting on, I knew. It just starts with I can't. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, my mental block was I didn't know how I was going to come up with the money for deals, and um, just changing your conversations, really going after it, and taking the action is fundamentally what can change that world for you, and you can accomplish it. And um, come see us in San Antonio. Awesome basically what he said. I mean, it's hard to, I, but I mean, it's true. You have to, it's really about positive mindset. For me, I still struggle with that. If I'm going to be completely honest, um, it's hard sometimes, like there are just days that suck. So <laughs> just knowing like we're, we're in this and knowing we're in this together, I think is really helpful for me. So yeah, I mean, it really comes down to the partner you choose because there's a lot of people, like there's not a lot of people that do this with their spouse. So for those of y'all doing it out there by yourself, definitely you have to have somebody rooting for you even if they're not with you on the day to day. So um, th they're either gonna make you or break you. So you need to have somebody, even if they're not doing it with you, who's gonna be there every day rooting you on because it's not an easy job. It's not easy getting out there and being told no a million times and having somebody who's okay with what you're doing. That's yeah. important, especially if you have a family with kids and. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people out there that stop this this business because their spouse isn't understanding of it, and they or want supportive. you to get a real job. Yeah, yeah, they want you to get a real job, a real job. All right. So, I would just say I agree with that. All right. Cool. Someone wants to get a hold of you. How do they do that? Facebook for sure. Uh, you can go to Hilco Homes on Facebook. We're really active on that. Or you can find us individually, Hillary Romero, Marco Romero. Well, you're Hillary W. Romero. Hillary W. Romero. And I'm Romero. Marco A. Romero. And you can find us on Hilco Homes. We could Homes. go to Hilco Homes and find us there. Uh, Bella Byers on Facebook. We also have Instagram, but anybody can message any of us and we're down. Connect we're with open us. people. So any questions, thoughts, anything, we'd be glad to share. And if you just want to come by the office and say hello, down, yeah. down yeah, to do that. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's a great show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank it you. was yeah. really fun. fun. Thank you guys for watching. Yes.